Um, I'm super excited to do this presentation. It's new and improved. We've been working on it for the last few weeks, so I won't say that I am an expert in it yet. Uh, there might be some little hiccups along the way, but I'm really excited to be going through it today. Just gonna close my curtain here because I can see I'm looking pretty ghosty. Okay, there we go. I think we're all set. All right, so mindfulness. So just really quick, who are we, the Canadian Mental Health Association? We have been operating in Canada for over a hundred years now, just looking for looking out for the mental health of all Canadians and believing that well-being is a right for everyone. And we help build that idea through community uh, engagement and education and all kinds of different things. So just some more specific information about uh, CMHA of NB specifically. So we have 18 different locations across the, uh, across the province. We have three main offices in Fredericton, Moncton, St. John. So of course the hubs we know as New Brunswickers, those are where we have dense populations, but we're also really lucky to have uh, community program coordinators, which fill out the rest of our province. We're really lucky to have them. So we have a wider reach across uh, the province so we can be working with rural areas and cities and getting all over the place. All right, well, let's get into the content. So I wanna say, first of all, I really hope that by the end of this presentation, my goal is that you leave feeling that mindfulness is a really simple and achievable skill. And I hope that you'll see that it is a very easy thing that we sometimes kind of dress up and make seem really uh, challenging and I hope that it will feel very approachable for you so that you can get the full wide range of benefits of uh, this concept. So that's really my goal is highlighting those simple things about it. So what is mindfulness? What are we talking about? So first of all, people have been practicing mindfulness for centuries. It is a very, very long practice. It has roots in different spiritual uh, or religious elements, um, and it's just been around for a really long time. However, recently we've kind of had a resurgence of mindfulness and people are more interested in it now. So today it's become a lot more popular in terms of things like the media and yoga and meditation, just kind of popularizing and glamorizing these different uh, practices. And that's great because it brings us, uh, it, it makes us aware of this really wonderful concept that is really achievable for everyone. However, the other side of the coin, which we know happens often, unfortunately, when it comes to social media and the internet, is things are often spun to be very complicated or they're given a sense of superiority or there's a right way and there's a wrong way. Um, and what we're gonna find out is mindfulness really isn't about any of that. So. I wanna know, please leave it in the chat. Um, I'll discuss a couple different things. What do you think of when you think of mindfulness? And there's a few different kind of extremes to this on the spectrum. So some people, especially, I, I wouldn't necessarily think that a lot of people that signed up for this webinar see it this way, because I'm sure you have some kind of interest and in maybe a grasp or, or a vague idea of it already. But a lot of people, when they hear mindfulness, they only think meditation and they only think of maybe like monks or people on the side of a cliff wearing a big white robe and, and different things like that. Um, or ocean sounds. And it's just this very kind of mystical, wooey kind of big idea. So some people, that's what we're thinking when we think mindfulness. For other people, it might they might be kind of caught up in that you know, current 2020 social idea of it where it's coloring books, you know, those really fancy ones that are beautiful. You can get them from chapters, they're a little bit pricey or um, really fancy yoga studios and beautiful bright windows and everyone's wearing cute Lululemon and we're all like, just like that idea right now. So I do see some stuff in the chat. I just wanted to see if anyone had some other ideas that I can throw out. Um, relaxation, yeah, absolutely. That is definitely one of the things that we want you to be thinking when you think mindfulness because it is definitely one of the goals. So that's kind of this middle place that I'm thinking on that spectrum. So, you know, like I said before, just to reiterate, we have this 
big wooey, again, fancy white robes, kind of um, and sitting cross-legged and all that things. We have that idea, or we have the opposite, which is the more current, more modern idea. And then we have that really comfortable place in the middle, which is where I'm hoping to bring all of us today, which is this peaceful, relaxing uh, concept. So thank you for that. Being in the moment, absolutely. All right, if you have any other ideas, absolutely feel free to drop them in the chat because I'll definitely be looking out for that. And not worrying, yes, what a nice thought that is. So I think it was Lisa, I think it said, um, was saying that when she thinks of mindfulness, they think of um, not worrying, which is such a lovely idea that I'm sure a lot of us are definitely looking for when we think of this, this process here. So. Now that we've kind of talked about it, we've opened it up, what do we think of? There's so many different things that we can think of when we think mindfulness. I've just named a handful here and we've had a few in the chat. But at the core, mindfulness is really one thing. Mindfulness is the practice of observing the present moment without judgment. So right now, it seems like now that it's becoming more popular and we have all these different ideas in the media about mindfulness, it seems like there's all these rules and there's ways to do it, there's ways not to do it. And it's very, there's a, it's like there's a very thin line of things that fit on this scale of what is mindfulness and what does it mean to have a mindfulness practice. But like I said, what I really want for everyone participating today is that you take that idea away and that you see that mindfulness ha like, has a reach in so many different things because at the core is one thing, which is the practice of observing the present moment without judgment. And I really love this definition. It's not always how I thought of it before, but when I heard it, I thought, you know what? that makes so much more sense. That is so much easier because a lot of times mindfulness seems really daunting because we think, you know, I have to empty my brain. I have to reach complete stillness, complete quiet. And that's why a lot of us are either resistant to even trying it or when we do try it, we feel, oh, I failed because human brains, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, aren't really meant to stop thinking entirely. It's not really how we're built. So I felt so much comfort when I found this definition. It's not about being quiet. It's not about controlling your brain or controlling your thoughts. It's the practice of observing the present moment without judgment. So let's talk more about what that means. So how do we observe? Starting with what sounds nice and simple. When we observe, we only take note of what we're actually, see, what's actually occurring in the present moment, much like a security camera. So anything that a security camera would pick up, that's observing. So a security camera alone, maybe the person watching will, but the camera alone isn't gonna be able to add thoughts and interpretations to what it's seeing. It's only gonna be able to say a man in a green jacket walked into the store at 10 o'clock this morning. That's it. There's no other interpretation. It's not adding to anything. Um, how do we observe without judgment? So when we make an observation, we do not add to what we observe. Now, it doesn't necessarily sound like there's a huge distinction between these two things, but the reason why we've kind of laid it out this way is because in itself, observing alone is very easy, um, as long as we try to do it. You know, it doesn't just happen. We do have to make the effort, but if I tell you to look around your room and make observations, you will be able to do it. So I know you can't see my room, which might be a good thing because my bed's not made this morning, unfortunately, but you can kind of imagine it. So if I decide to observe right now, there is this brown curtain. There is my pink sheets in my pillowcase. It's falling off on one side. Um, my hamper is in the corner. I have a picture frame on the wall to my right and a picture frame straight ahead of me. Those are all observations. And that was very easy for me to say because all I have to do is look around and see it. Right now, you might be looking at me and you might say, um, you know, Claire, I don't think I said my name. Claire is wearing a blue shirt. Uh, Claire's voice is slightly low for a woman's voice. 
uh, she keeps saying, um, <laughs> she's thinking, these are all observations that you might be making just by looking at my screen right now. That's easy because all we have to do is recount what we're seeing, hearing, smelling, whatever. We can do that. Now, observing without judgment is not so easy. And the reason why is because a judgment is anything that we're adding. And that includes our interpretations. It includes what we feel when we make those observations. It includes any thought outside of this is what I see. And that's a lot harder. And the reason why that's so difficult is because we as humans aren't built that way. We're built to be problem solvers. It's helpful that when we see something, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we add meaning or we add an interpretation to it. So here's an example. If my observation is there's dust on this chair that I'm sitting on, if I'm not consciously trying to not make a judgment, likely my next thought is going to be, this chair needs to be wiped down, it needs to be cleaned. Now that's a good thing because I saw a problem, I observed it, and then by adding meaning or adding an interpretation to it, I've solved the problem. That's what humans do. We're critical thinkers, we're problem solvers, they're skills. The thing is, right now, especially right now, but in modern 2020 world, there are way too many things for us to fix and for us to control and for us to perfect that if we're always trying to add meaning and interpret and make things better, we exhaust ourselves. And I'm sure everyone listening, and I know myself, have gotten to that point where we're just trying to make everything perfect and we just can't. So the thing about mindfulness is it's taking a moment to allow ourselves to be okay with everything as is. It's allowing ourselves to say, I don't need to solve everything right now. I can just sit, notice that there's dust on the chair and not feel the need and not have to feel the need to clean it and to fix it. I'm allowed to just be here and let it be what it is, even if it's a problem. So we're already getting a little bit more complicated here. Um, but it's a practice and that's the point. As I've just said, this is not natural to us and you need to acknowledge that before you can start your own practice because we're expecting a lot of ourselves and that's why you have to continuously practice it. So that being said, we're going to do that a little bit. So first of all, how do we practice mindfulness? Um, so one thing I want to make clear, and this is kind of going back to what we were talking about before, but mindfulness is about what you're doing, or is not, haha, <laughs> it's not about what you're doing, but how you're doing something. So right now, again, 2020, we're really caught up in the ideas of the right way to do mindfulness, whether it's meditation, you know, sitting down in a quiet space for 20 minutes, or it's a coloring book, or all of these things that Pinterest and Facebook have handed to us and said, okay, this is how you do it. This is how you be mindful. But the thing is, mindfulness is not about what you're doing. It's about how you're doing it. So I love this photo here. Um, so let's walk through it just a little bit. So mindful or mindful. So mindful, the person, and I love that it's a person versus a dog because it's really easy to grasp it. Like I said, we're always thinking, we're always solving problems, we're always being critical about things. So this person, as they're out for a walk, their mind is full. They're thinking about all of these different things that they have to do or the things that are going in their around in their lives and all these different things. Their mind is full. But my, being mindful like the dog is, is simply seeing what is for as it is. So we see the scene, we see what the dog's thinking about. So this dog or th this couple here, the two of them, they're not doing a coloring book. They're not... Um, sitting by the ocean meditating. It's not about that. It's about the mindset that they're applying to whatever they're doing. And in this case, it's just going for a walk. 
the dog is applying a mindful perspective because they're the dog well the dog is choosing but we know this is just what dogs do but if it were a person they would be choosing to be mindful by just observing the situation without judgment without changing it without adding to it it is what it is so let's get to the big issue what do I do when I can't stop thinking? Again, we're just trying to tear down these ideas as much as we can because we have this idea that mindfulness is quieting the mind. And I should be able to sit down for 20 minutes and not have a single thought because that's what I'm deciding to do. That's not what's gonna happen. So what to do when you can't stop thinking? You just move on. And one way I really like to think about this is that if the practice is the practice of observing without judgment and we make a judgment so we have a thought are we going to continue to judge ourselves we're making a judgment we're just kind of continuing that cycle and going further and further so instead what you should be doing is when you have a thought or many thoughts you know a lot of the time we're already far down into the hole before we realize you know, that we've been thinking, that we've lost focus. What you should be doing instead of thinking, why did I think that? I shouldn't have had that thought. I'm meditating right now. Or I'm practicing mindfulness. I shouldn't have been doing all of this stuff in my head. We're not doing that. The second that you notice that you've had a thought, all you're meant to do is just take a second and say, I had a thought and go back to whatever you're focusing on, whatever your anchor is. So what your anchor is, is I think, yeah. So it's whatever you're observing in that moment. So the reason we make observations is again, we can't just think, or we can't just stop thinking for no reason. So before I was talking about the things I'm seeing in my room, if I was practicing mindfulness right now, I'm sitting here, I'm making observations and all of a sudden my mind starts to wander. What I would do is I would go back to looking at the things in my room and observing those. So I would go back and say, my sheets are pink. There's a, a photo or a photograph over there and there's a photograph over there. Like it's just bringing yourself back to what you were focusing on to go back to that place of observation. So um, I have a video here and I absolutely adore it. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get it to work because I am not a Zoom expert, but I know that there's a way, so I'm gonna give it a shot. Um, so. Try the mic. Okay. New share. Space. All right. Now, sound. Music or computer sound only. Oh, I think I made it. You were sharing computer sound. Okay. Share screen. Basic. Okay. Ah, I figured it out. There we are. I figured it out. Okay. Believe me, this video, definitely worth it. So I figured out the sound. Um, if something is not right, please let me know, but it's only a minute long, so let's. Training the mind is often quite different to how people imagine it to be. Maybe they have an idea it's about stopping thoughts or eliminating feelings, but the reality is a bit different. An easy way to think of it is to imagine yourself sitting on the side of a busy road, the passing cars representing the thoughts and the feelings. All you have to do is to sit there and watch the cars. Sounds easy, right? But what usually happens is that we feel a bit unsettled by the movement of the traffic. So we run out into the road and try and stop the cars, or maybe even chase after a few, forgetting that the idea was to just sit here. And of course, all of this running around only adds to the feeling of restlessness in the mind. So training the mind is about changing our relationship with the passing thoughts and feelings. Learning how to view them with a little more perspective. And when we do this, we naturally find a place of calm. Will we sometimes forget the idea of the exercise and become distracted? Of course we will. But as soon as we remember, here we are, back on the side of the road again just watching the traffic go by, perfectly at ease, 
in both body and mind. All right. Okay. Isn't that just the best video? It. I feel like when that little drawing guy like takes this deep breath and just sits there in front of the traffic, like I feel like I can feel it. It's such a comforting video to me because it is, again, stripping that idea down of we have to be able to stop the, the traffic. We have to be able to stop the thoughts. And what this video and this animation, and, and by the way, this is done by a very credible organization, um, the, the man speaking, he is an expert in meditation specifically, but also mindfulness. So it's very, it's a credible source. Um, yeah, it's so comforting to me because I feel like I just slow down and I think, great, that totally makes sense. I can't stop the traffic and especially jumping into the traffic and trying to chase the cars around will absolutely not stop the traffic. What I can do is accept that, you know, it's a busy day on the road, but I can just sit back and watch the cars go by. So um, that video is, you can find it on YouTube, it's called Headspace Changing Perspective, and I absolutely love it. Um, so, yeah. All right, so we've learned kind of the basics so far, and I, and I want to practice it now. So I want to go over really quickly what we've talked about. So we talked about um, mindfulness as the practice of observing um, without, uh, without judgment. And we talked about what to do when you inevitably make those judgments. So now I want to practice. And again, it would be so lovely if we were together and I was seeing you guys practice this and we could do it together, but it is what it is, c'est la vie. So um, what I'm gonna have you do here is this is a photo I've taken. This is a photo of my desk that I sit at every day when I'm at work. And what I want you to do is to observe this photo without judgment. And if you could, again, it's not gonna be a true mindful practice because you'll be thinking about typing and everything, but I would love if you would share with me what you observe when you're looking at this. Um, so I'm gonna give you a few seconds because I would really love if you would share with me and then we'll kind of walk through what this exercise maybe could have looked like. So just take a moment, just slow down and observe what you're seeing in this photo. All right, so I hope you've all had the chance to sit back and look at it and take it in and make some mental notes to yourself about what you're seeing in this photo. Um, so just to walk you through it, if I was going to be making observations about this photo, I would say that there's a coffee cup. Um, I'm really sorry they're doing construction outside of my house that I'm not sure if you can hear it or not, but hopefully it will end shortly. Um, so what I'm seeing is a, a coffee mug, I'm seeing some pencils and in the background there's some words on a, um, it's, it's hard for me to not say what they are because I know exactly what's there, but um, there's some kind of words on some board, there's a plant in the background, there are some green leaves, there are a few brown leaves, um, there's a wooden box underneath, and that's basically what I see. So why we're doing this activity is because I want you to see what true observation is and what the difference between observing without judgment and observing with judgment is. So it's fairly likely that a lot of you saw this photo and thought, while I said there's a mug, there's coffee around it, you may have thought very automatically, very naturally, that that mug is dirty or that mug needs to be cleaned. Now, even when those, those things happen very naturally because it is within our nature to solve problems, that is still a judgment. That is still your brain telling you, that's dirty, I don't like that it's dirty, it needs to be clean. Another thing you might have said is, <laughs> the mug needs a refill. 
I love that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so another thing you might have seen is the uh, slightly brown leaves here. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm circling them a little bit there. You might have said that that um, plant needs to be trimmed a little bit or that the leaves are dead. But however, that's still making a judgment. You're still seeing there is a problem with that and this is how it could be fixed. Instead, you should be, not should, that's not the right word. Your goal is to be saying the, there are leaves that are green, there are leaves that are brown. That doesn't need to mean any more than it does, but the fact that some are green and some are brown. The next thing I want to point out, um, Heather commented um, that the mug needs a refill, and I love that. She's so right. Uh, <laughs> any mug with a little bit, uh, not enough, definitely needs to be refilled. And I really appreciate that you pointed that out because it gives me the opportunity to explain that even when we make a judgment that is positive because she said the mug needs to be refilled. She said it makes her think of comfort. Absolutely, that's what I see as well. Could you let me know if it's too loud outside because now they've started mowing and I might be able to move if it is too loud. So if there's an issue with the sound, please comment um, in the chat. Um, sorry about that. So even though the idea of refilling the mug is comfortable and very warm, we can hear you well. Okay, thank you, Mindy. It's really distracting me. I appreciate you giving me that feedback. Um, so even though the, the mug might need to be refilled, it's very warm, it's a very comforting thought, that is still a judgment. Not in the traditional sense when we think judging, we think of something very negative. It's a judgment in the fact that we're adding something to the situation. This mug is not good or bad. It is a mug. Yes, there's coffee rings around it, and that might mean to me that it is dirty or it needs to be washed, but that's not what I'm thinking about right now because I'm letting this photo and this situation be exactly what it is by itself. The mug might need to be refilled, but that's not what I'm thinking about right now. The mug is what it is. Um, the mug made me think that you're drinking coffee. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great observation. Um, and one thing that's nice, uh, what you're saying about seeing multiple things, that's great. First of all, that means that you're very quick to make observations, which is really good. It means you're noticing a lot and that makes it easier because it means you're more in tune with those senses and you can see more, which leads me to my next point is if you were someone that thought something about the cup being dirty or the mug needing to be cleaned. That's okay that you thought that. It's natural that you thought that. We are um, animals that think. However, what you could do in that situation now is say, okay, I had a thought. I noticed the cup was dirty. I thought it needed to be cleaned. Now I'm gonna move on to the plant. The plant is green, the plant is brown, the plant is in a yellow pot. Um, and then I might think, oh, I love that pot. Well, now I, you know, I've made another thought. I'm going to move on. There's both pens and pencils in that mug or in that jar, sorry. It's the process of, even though in that moment, the idea is I'm not supposed to be thinking those things or adding those things. It's okay that I did. I just move on anyway. So I hope that helped you grasp the whole observing without judgment idea. Um, it's just stripping it away and thinking of it in that simple of terms just makes this a much more approachable uh, process. So I hope that was helpful to you. All right, moving on. And I, I personally feel that that is the most complicated part of the presentation. It's the most kind of hand-holding and everything. Um, so hopefully we're going well so far. So let's talk about all that. So I just spent about a half an hour explaining this whole process. Uh, maybe it seems really unnatural. Maybe it seems kind of difficult to you. So why are we doing it? Why bother? Why are we putting this effort into doing something that is so against our nature and how our brain wants to act? So there are so many benefits of mindfulness and it is so fascinating. I haven't mentioned yet, but I'm coming at this presentation from a psychology background. I'm currently a third year student at St. Thomas University. And this stuff is so fascinating to me because we have 
tons of research that shows that there is something that us as humans can do, regardless of our age, regardless of our ableness, regardless of anything, something we can do that will make our life better in X amount of ways, which is what we're about to go through. So these are some of the, I guess, terminology, the more technical things that we have studied, not we as in me, obviously, but papers I've reviewed throughout the course of my studies, where we have seen mindfulness objectively um, relates to this. So more mindfulness relates to this, or however you want to say it. So I've separated them here in a few different categories. So we have general health benefits reduces stress. Um, I feel like it's a broken record when we talk about stress, but it's because stress impacts so much of us. Um, mindfulness has been proven to reduce stress, improve sleep quality, improved brain health. Uh, there's a lot of therapeutic benefits for mental health issues or mental illness that have been studied. And on that point, I want to mention really quickly, while we don't dive into the specifics here, if that does some, sound something that might be interesting to you, definitely look up, um, you know, CBT, using mindfulness. There's a lot of different therapeutic um, avenues that are being explored in this domain. So if you have any issues or any questions about that, definitely contact us and we can point you in some directions. Um, so cognitively, so in terms of, you know, how we're thinking, how strong our brain is, things like that, um, it improves focus, greater memory, greater learning, more cognitive flexibility, uh, it can lead to less, being less judgmental, being less reactive, um, and less rumination and daydreaming. That's a big one. It was a big one for me when I started practicing mindfulness, and I think for a lot of you that really identify with being an overthinker, that's going to be really helpful, this point of less rumination, less turning things over and thinking and thinking and thinking about the same thing. Um, so in other words, lots of big fancy words there, lots of um, not necessarily super exciting things, but this is a short list of what all of those benefits kind of translate into. And I'm not going to go through every one, but the point is, there's something for everyone. There is some kind of benefit that you can get out of this practice, whether it's um, helping you with anxiety issues that you might have, being a better caregiver when we're less judgmental, we're more patient, we're more able to care for our children or our loved ones, um, being less critical, that results in um, being less critical of yourself, being less critical of others. I don't think I have to explain why excuse me, that's a positive attribute to have. Um, better health in general, better immune system, fewer, fewer cognitive distortions. So what that is, is cognitive distortions are thinking traps, basically. If you have a tendency to think in certain ways that might make a situation seem more difficult for you or might hurt you in some kind of way, um, mindfulness can help with that. Um, so there are tons and tons of benefits. So how does it have so many benefits? My thinking when I first learned about this stuff was, okay, so sitting down and looking around the room, for example, and just noticing things is supposed to make me have better health. It's supposed to make me learn better. It's supposed to make my relationships better. We have all of this wide evidence now and all of these colloquialisms where people are saying, oh yeah, you know, mindfulness leads to better this, this, and this. And it doesn't really make sense when you think about it at first because you think these are such huge impacts. How is it happening? So there are three main ways that this happens. So mindfulness changes your brain changes your hormones, and it changes your perception. So it changes your brain. Regular mindfulness practice increases gray matter in your brain. So basically, how your brain does anything, how it communicates and how it tells your body and the other parts of your brain to do something, is through sending signals. And the faster a signal can send, the more efficient your brain is working. Um, and the way that it sends signals more quickly is through gray matter. The way we get gray matter is the same way we build our muscles, for example. We get stronger muscles from repetitive activation of the same muscle. 
we get more gray matter by repetitive activation of the same brain region. So that was very sciencey. I feel like I'm back in school, but this is make will help make it a lot more clear. So imagine when you're learning to play an instrument. I like to use guitar because I guess it's what I know. But when you start playing guitar, um, when you're playing a song, you first put your fingers where they're supposed to be and then you strum. And then you strum and you strum and you strum until you need to switch notes. And then you pause for a second and you think, okay, my finger goes here, here, and here. And then you start strumming again. Good. And then you have to switch and you have to think again. But there's the reason why when we're listening to music on the radio, it doesn't sound like dun, 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 dun. <laughs> it's consistent. It's one straight line, if you will. There's no pauses in between the notes. That's because when we start learning a new skill, like playing guitar, our brain has to learn these new signals and because it's not used to them, they move slower. So when I'm only learning guitar, my brain can only tell my fingers so quickly where to go because it hasn't had any practice doing that. But as we learn to play guitar more and more, we're still activating the same brain regions and we move faster and we're able to have that consistent song-like, um, Basically, there's no pauses in between the songs because our brain is able to practically automatically tell our fingers how to move because by constantly reactivating those same pathways, we get more gray matter and that makes our signals move faster. I hope that made sense. The reason why this is so interesting is because when we practice mindfulness, we get more gray matter in areas related to focus, present time awareness, reasoning, memory, and emotional regulation. So what that should tell you is that, first of all, our brain is physically changing by practicing this, which, I mean, I'm a psych nerd, but that is so fascinating to me and has so much weight and credibility to it. But also that we're focusing better because our brain is working more efficiently when with the parts of our brain that focus because that is the part of our brain that we're exercising. So that's how it results in these kinds of changes, the changes related to thinking and uh, learning and all of that. Now, that was the most complicated, so moving on. Mindfulness changes your hormones. So this is how we get all of these um, immune, body health, and stress-related benefits that we often hear of when we're talking mindfulness. So mindfulness helps to manage cortisol levels. So when we first talked about what do you think when you hear mindfulness, a few people said um, like relaxing and calm and in terms like that. That's because when we practice mindfulness, we re regulate the hormones in our body that cause stress. And we all know too much stress and too much cortisol can have negative impacts on our organs, like our heart, um, it can result in anxious and depressive symptoms, um, all kinds of problems we know come along with stress. And this is also why uh, mindfulness results in better immune health. And lastly, I find this one very interesting as well, is mindfulness changes our perception. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking those benefits with relationships and being a caregiver and being patient. So basically, when we have an experience, we react to it because that's what life is. That's what we do. <laughs> um, but what happens when we practice mindfulness is we have a buffer between that experience and that reaction. And we all know <laughs> that we have had experiences where this first example, experience to reaction, is how we get ourselves in trouble or how we say things that we regret because we're immediately responding based on how we've felt and how we interpreted that situation. And when we're not slowing down to assess the situation and to think about it and to actually process it, we're sometimes responding in a way that is just not accurate for the situation because we're responding purely out of emotion and not out of reason at all. So it's that practice of slowing down and observing a situation without judgment, observing something for exactly what it is, that allows us 
to respond in a way that is more, you know, feels better for us, feels better for the person we're talking to. Um, and I think a really good example of this that I personally find really helpful. I really struggle with the opinions or feedback, even the most constructive feedback from authority or from people that I respect. So in my case, because I'm a university student, it would be like from my professors. So if I've worked really hard on a paper and I get this feedback that, I don't know, for whatever reason, it wasn't great. That feedback can result in these kind of alarm bells for me because I feel defensive and I feel hurt because I want to be coming off as best as I can. So when I get that feedback, I go from experience to reaction really quickly because that's a point of insecurity for me. And that is a point of tension. So I'm reacting defensively. However, if I take time between my experience, and my reaction to slow down and process the feedback and think to myself, okay, this professor is not signaling me out. He doesn't think that I'm not smart. She doesn't think that I'm going to fail this class. She doesn't think that I didn't work hard. If I step back and process, this is what learning is. This is what university is. I give in work. They give me feedback then I can respond in a much better way. I can instead think, you know, I wish I had done a little bit better, but you know, now I know for next time to do it in this way. And that practice of observing without judgment helps us get from the point of the experience and the emotional response to that response that is going to serve us better in the long run. So, so many benefits. We've just talked about a ton of stuff that um, I think we all want. I think we all want better relationships and we all want to be less self-conscious, less judgmental, better health, all of these things. So why don't we just all do this? This sounds like this magic cure, this medicine that we can just take and be our best selves and our most relaxed self. What stops us? There's some few uh, there's a few, sorry, misconceptions around mindfulness, and I've alluded to this pretty much throughout the whole presentation. And the first big one is I need to completely quiet my mind. A lot of us think that, and when we sit down to practice mindfulness and we can't quiet our mind, all of a sudden it's this panic and we failed and that feels bad. We don't like that feeling, so we think, okay, I just can't do it. I don't want to feel like a failure. I'm not going to do it at all. Our brains are made to think. And it is that simple. And you shouldn't approach this from a place of, I need to completely quiet my mind because you will ultimately feel like you failed. But mindfulness is not something you can succeed or fail at, which is my next point. I've realized I've now jumped ahead. Um, but there's no success, there's no failure. It's simply the effort of trying and consistently bringing yourself back to that anchor that we talked about and understanding you absolutely will think. And if anything you're listening to, if you're listening to some kind of guided meditation or if someone's telling you about meditation as good because you quiet your brain, they're probably not coming from a point of research about mindfulness because we know brains are meant to think they're not going to be quiet we have a much better chance of getting the benefits of mindfulness if we go at that from that perspective. So I just kind of mentioned this, but the idea that there's a right, a right way to practice and a wrong way, absolutely not. It's whatever way feels good for you and a way that you can practice observing without judgment in a way that is easy and achievable and encouraging for you. There are expenses. Sometimes we think, you know, oh, I'll start a mindfulness practice when I can afford that yoga membership or when I can afford that expensive app subscription or when I can get to chapters and buy that expensive um, Mandela um, coloring book. There are no expenses. Those things are nice, absolutely. And if you do, ha if you do have that means and you do enjoy it, absolutely enjoy it. But those ways of practicing are, first of all, not necessary and in no way superior. You have exactly all you need, and that is a brain. And what we've been saying this whole time is it doesn't matter how, or, oh, I did it again. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It only matters how you're doing it. And how you're doing it is from a place of observation without judgment. And that's all you actually need. 
this isn't the right time. So I'm sure all of us sitting here today, we have busy lives. We have a lot going on. If you're a parent, you likely don't have a perfect quiet room without any interruptions, especially not on a daily basis. You know, you might get the one really good day where it's really easy nobody rings your doorbell no kid is knocking on the door nothing like that's happening but you probably won't <laughs> so just accepting there are always distractions and that's okay and that shouldn't stop you from practicing mindfulness because there's no right way to do it you don't need the perfect quiet room because you probably don't have it most days instead just accept um, those distractions as a part of your practice today. So a great example, I'm very happy that uh, a few people said that my sound was okay, but if I were to try to practice mindfulness right now with the whippersnipper going outside my window and the sounds of a dump truck backing up, I could really easily get really frustrated and say, oh, I can't be mindful in here. There's too much going on. Or I could sit and say, one of the things I'm hearing is the sound of the truck backing up. And that's it. And the last thing is practicing is complicated. So that's kind of what I've been trying to reinforce this whole time. Because of how popular it's become, we have we feel there's a right way, we feel there's a wrong way, there's certain things you have to do, there's parts of it that are superior. There's no rules. There's no one way to do it. It's whatever feels good to you. And stepping back and seeing it from a perspective of practicing, sorry, observing without judgment takes away all that complication. All right. So before we close down here, I have a quick exercise if you want to try it. Um, so this is one of those really good examples of something that is really simple, really achievable, and something that you can absolutely just do on your own. So if you feel comfortable, this is probably the best way to do it because you're probably sitting alone right now. Um, just sit back in your chair, take a second to get comfortable, and just follow my instructions, follow my guided meditation, basically. So. Take three deep belly breaths, exhaling slowly each time, imagining the tension drain out of your body. Now, clench your fist, hold before releasing and feel the tension drain from your hands. Release. Now, while continuing to breathe in and out slowly, tighten your biceps by drawing your forearms up towards your shoulders and tense your muscles with both arms. Hold, relax. Tense your muscles around your eyes. Cleanse your eyelids shut. Hold, relax. Tighten your jaw. Open your mouth as widely as you can and stretch the muscles around the hinges of your jaw. Hold, then relax. Tighten the muscles in your shoulder blades by pushing your shoulder blades back. Hold, then relax. Mentally scan your upper body for any leftover tension. Is there tension in your face? Give yourself permission to relax. Is there tension in your arms? 
Take a deep breath and release the tightness. If any muscles remain tense, repeat the exercise for those muscles. All right, so again, it's easier in a room where I can see people's reactions and everything. But the point is, is that that was a simple exercise of bringing yourself to awareness of your body. So when I'm saying tense your upper body, you're likely thinking about how to flex your muscles. You're thinking about how it feels when you pull back or when you um, release and you're not necessarily changing the situation. You're just doing what the exercise tells you to. And it's things that are as simple as this, which are, you know, checking in with your body and using your body as a tool for focus that you can bring with you and use as regularly as you want. It doesn't have to be a hour long yoga class. It could be a simple exercise like this, um, which this was called progressive muscle relaxation. And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, so before we close up here, I just want to send you guys off with a, sorry, um, I'm just going to share a list of, sorry, of some other ideas that you can use. Okay, share. So the whole point of this chat that we've had is to talk about how mindfulness can be really attainable and really simple. So here's a list of a few different things that you can do on your own. Um, so one specific example is using the five senses. So notice five things that you can see, notice four things you can feel, notice three things you can hear, so on and so on. Um, exercises like that are really great because you can use them whenever you need them. You always have your senses with you and it's something that you can sit back and just observe the situation in that way. Um, here's another one, so mindful eating. So the example here is of a raisin. Um, however, <laughs> you can do it with any kind of food you need, but same thing, it's a really accessible example. You should be eating three meals a day or eating uh, fairly often, and that's a great time that you can use to practice mindfulness. It's just about noticing, you know, all the different elements of eating. We so often rush through our meals. We eat just because we need to feel full. Mindful eating is the opposite. It's when you slow down and take time to notice the taste of your food, notice the texture, Notice your sense of fullness, your physical sensations in your stomach as you're eating. Notice how it feels to chew, all of these different things. Um, so this is what I was most looking forward to going over here is how to practice mindfulness at any time. So I gave those couple of examples because for some people it's a lot easier to have specific structured examples. Um, but the thing about mindfulness is you can bring it with you absolutely anywhere and anytime you're doing something that doesn't require the active consciousness to complete. So what I mean by that is if we're acting on autopilot, for example, when we're taking a shower, you know, I've taken a shower most days for the last 20 years. I no longer have to think, okay, now I grab the bar of soap, I pull it up, I pull it down, I pull it up, pull it down. I don't have to think about that anymore. It just happens on autopilot. So because I don't have to be using um, my cognitive resources to complete that task, I can use them to practice mindfulness. And that's true for any and all daily activities like that. So walking, um, doing the dishes, eating, as we said before, um, while you're exercising, um, anything. It just kind of depends what your life looks like. When you're mopping the floors, when you're making dinner, it depends what are those automatic things for you. But the way to turn any of those mindless kind of time filler activities into something that's mindful is by, first of all, slowing down, trying to release that idea of rush and getting just getting through whatever you're doing, and taking time to notice one of the two things, your senses. So taking time to observe everything you're recording in your sensory perception. So taste, touch, sight, um, sound, and smell, if those are all available to you. So just slowing down and tuning into those things. 
the practice of mindfulness is not actually about your senses. It's about the fact that your, your senses are objective. So it's easy for you to tone into them and practice that observation without judgment. Or your breath. A lot of people really enjoy um, mindful breathing. I like it, but I find for myself it's more, I have to think more when I'm doing mindful breathing, um, but it's just another option. Um, so lastly here, um, if guided meditation is better, or guided mindfulness is better for you, maybe your, you know, the self-led approach isn't necessarily for you. There's so many other ways that you can practice mindfulness. So audio meditations, yoga, and Tai Chi are all really good examples. And the great thing about those and the great thing about our world now in 2020 um, is that so many of those things are available to you online. So you can explore YouTube, the app stores, whether you have Android or Apple, or even just a quick Google search will absolutely um, bring you some things that you can just follow along and listen to if you're not necessarily motivated or um, to do those things by yourself, if it doesn't feel good to you, because sometimes it can be harder, but for other people listening to something, that's more of a challenge. So these are a lot of different examples, but it's whatever works, uh, works for you. And just some helpful search terms that might help you to find these things. Um, meditation, mindfulness, mindful breathing, guided meditation, or yoga will all help you come up with some stuff. All right. So, um, I'm hoping you can see, the, yeah, okay, you can see the presentation again. Oh, just to wrap it up here, just to sum up a little bit, things to remember for your practice going forward, um, just decide to practice. It's not going to happen naturally. It is a bit of a habit, and that's often the, the kind of hurdle that is the hardest to get past. But no matter what is going on, no matter how crazy your world is, because it inevitably will be, um, all you have to do is decide to practice. There's no good or bad. There's no succeeding at meditation. It's just about, or mindfulness, sorry. My version of mindfulness is often meditation. So I, I sometimes, if you'll have to excuse me, I do um, confuse the words a little bit. But um, mindfulness is not about having a good mindfulness session or a bad one. It's just about deciding to practice and that's enough. What is, is enough, you know, Observing without judgment is all about this idea. You don't need to go in and change and perfect and fix everything. That's the hardest part. We're constantly trying to problem solve and we're constantly trying to make everything perfect and tidy in the exact way we want it to be. Mindfulness is just sitting back, which we all need to do, and accepting that what is, is enough. Accepting you will have thoughts. We're made to think, your brain will think, that's what it does. It's kind of like how the purpose of your lungs is to breathe, the purpose of your brain is to think. You can't expect it to just stop. When you do have thoughts, return to your anchor. You don't need to panic, you don't need to feel like a failure, you just need to go back and say, you know, the next thing is that uh, the plant is green, like we were talking about in that last example. Um, and mindfulness is a practice. It's gonna look different every day because you're gonna be different every day. The point is to just do it as often as you can in a way that feels good to you and in a way that you will engage with it and you will get its many benefits. You just have to practice it. Like we were talking about with the changes in your brain, it's the same way as if you're constantly activating muscle, you're constantly activating that part of your brain. And the more you do it, the more benefits you're gonna get. So that is all. I did see that there are some questions in the Q&A. So before I read them, I am just going to give everyone a heads up that if you do have any questions to please direct them in the Q&A now. Um, but otherwise, I will be finishing up here in a second. If you do have time, please stick by for that um, survey at the end. It's really, really helpful to us. And it's just a couple minutes uh, tops. Uh, if you are jumping out before I get to the Q&A, just a quick uh, shout out here to our, uh, our phone number, our office phone number, if you have any questions, also our social media pages, and our email if you have any questions. If you have questions specifically for me, you can absolutely 
um, reach out to that email here and they will forward it to me and I'll be able to uh, contact you. But otherwise, before I get into the Q&A, thank you so much for joining me today.